Hello and welcome to Dirhams and Dollars, the Gulf News business podcast, where we talk about news affecting the business community in the region and in the world. On Wednesdays, we look at stories making headlines and we have in-depth conversations on a topic of the week. You can find us at golfnews.com and you can always download the latest episodes from iTunes. I'm Ed Klaus and today I'm joined by... I'm Sarah Dia. And I'm Scott Shui. All right, everyone, welcome to our first show of 2019. Now, you may be wondering, what is 2019 have in store for us. Well, it's the same crap we had in 2018, pretty much across the board. You reckon, We're, or do you think it will be worse? Uh, I'm not saying the intensity of it, but it's basically the same stuff. We're a week into 2019, and we're right back to U.S. trying to trade wars, more Donald Trump inspired, you know, chaos. And because apparently the Brits don't like the colonialists, you know, getting ahead of them, they have their own little thing called Brexit to prove that they are just as crazy as the Americans. Three months away, less than three months Six, away. Sixty days, almost, I believe, March 12th. So, you know, me being a rather of a cynical disposition, I have decided... You cynical? Surely yes, not. I have decided 2019 isn't going to be any more merciful than 2018, 2017, and 2016. And we're going to be talking about this crap all year. So my suggestion is we talk about anything else today. Anything else. So, anybody been to Vegas recently? Sadly not. <laughs> That's a sign to do what? Start your little bit. I don't have a bit. Well, then you got a bit? <laughs> that, was the whole that was the whole bit. point. That was the whole point. You I never said jump I had in. a bit. I said jump in. You were going to do questions. <laughs> we don't have multiple angles to cut between us, so there's right. going to be a chop in the video. All right. Or we just keep this in the video <laughs> and see sure. how sausage is made. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah, why not? So, let's start off. Have you been to Vegas recently or seen any news out of Vegas? Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Right. Uh, I have not been to Vegas, unfortunately for me. I have seen news out of Vegas, but I've been ignoring it because it's tech news. And so when tech news goes on my like Twitter timeline, I just scroll down and find finance. You actually have tech news on your Twitter timeline. That's actually more than I expected. When you, when you retweet it, basically, or when oh, okay. it's like the BBC when or New York Times. When I force it in your timeline. Yeah, I just scroll past it. Okay. Well, for those of you who aren't aware, normally when it's a boring news year, everyone focuses on the first week of January as the big consumer electronics show in Las Vegas. This is the year, or this is the place where everyone sort of gets together and has, you know, their big launch of the year or showcases new technology. And there's all kinds of awards. And it's a pretty big deal in Las Vegas. You can't get a room right now in Vegas if you wanted to go there. It's mm-hmm. it's crazy busy. And uh, Ed's covered it before. I've covered it a couple of times. And it's a great place to go. But if you're actually covering it, it's pretty much work. I mean, mm-hmm. you don't walk out of there without you know anything less than three blisters if you've covered the entire show. Yeah, now, it's not. It's the opposite of relaxing or, you know, sort of. It, it's not. It's not fun. I mean, it's fun to a, to a degree, but it, it is exhausting. I mean, if you think about, like, the World Trade Center here in Dubai or Adnec in Abu Dhabi, I mean, they just they shrivel in comparison to the size of um, Well, Vegas of, of is probably at least, I don't know, two, three times the size of Dubai. It's just huge. Yeah, and, and the exhibition center itself is, is like, a magnitude, orders of magnitude larger than, uh, than Adnec, yeah. and it's spread across, like, three or four different hotels. Yeah, it, it actually just overflows enormous. out into the hotels, yeah. to the Venetian and onto the Strip and all kinds of places, and it becomes pretty big. All right, so we've seen the news come out. It actually started over the weekend. We've So anything in particular you've seen? you think is good this year so i mean i think we can sort of break it down into a few different categories i, I mean it, it is a f- event focused on consumer technology as you said and i think y- you know this year the, f- the focus or the emphasis really seems to be on uh, a few different things so health healthcare or health tech um driving or cars uh, seems to be a very big focus this year um and sort of home tech or sort of smart home appliances so i mean i'll start off with the with the cars uh we've seen the audi aon i believe it's 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 pronounced it's a-i-o-n i believe now the car was actually uh, unveiled in 2017 but they've uh, updated it and they've sort of done a full broad unveiling this year uh with an eye to having it on the road by 2020 now you may say okay that's it's you know we're, we're thinking more gadgets this is a this is a car you know it's going to cost probably a hundred thousand dollars or something but i i think increasingly tech is moving from the home into the car and certainly when i was in vegas last january for ces there was a huge emphasis placed by traditional tech companies like panasonic like sony philips 
uh, on putting their tech into automobiles. And, and I think increasingly we're going to see very futuristic looking cars with sort of HUDs or head up displays that in, in the place of where the sort of speedometer used to be. It's going to look more like a kind of three or four iPads now. So the Audi is a very, very impressive car uh, with lots and lots of impressive tech in. Um, and then as a sort of offshoot of that, the, the, we had a, a flying car, I believe it's called the Nexus Blue, and uh, it's sort of a prototype for a... That's a VTOL. What's that? A vertical takeoff and landing uh, thing. Right, yes. They, they were going to use this for taxis. I've yes, seen this. Exa- this is exactly. very cool looking. Yeah, exactly. So they, they did a test run down the Las Vegas Strip, uh, I believe, yesterday. And yeah, uh, absolutely, as you say, it's, a, it's essentially a taxi um, prototype. Uh, an airborne taxi and you know basically what it looks like is a car with four giant fans on yes. top but they're in case so they're not like the old-fashioned yeah. helicopters which would chop up people if you weren't <laughs> ca- careful i'm yeah. serious if no you, yeah yeah, yeah you have to be very careful when you're a pilot to make sure no one goes around the back of the helicopter yeah, because yeah. people get killed that way yeah this thing seems to be much more oriented on making sure everything's safe and no one yeah. can get you know lose any body parts because you took a taxi yeah who uh, drives it do you have to have a a, a Car license or a pilot's li- a pilot's license? <laughs> I actually, I don't think the regulatory issues have quite caught up with VTOLs and everything else is coming on. No, but I mean, I, I know, but I think there's no driver. I think it is largely automated. In the sky? Oh yes. my god! So it's a, it's a hybrid, right? And so it, it, a lot like sort of the Teslas and and other self driving vehicles at the moment are hybrid systems, so that they can have a manual human driver or be automated. So I can pick up the. Controls right. if I start to crash and burn, because that's so much more comforting knowing that I'm at the controls. Right of a of a fl- an airborne taxi, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think you know, as you say, rightly so that that regulatory frameworks have not really been adapted to this new class of of, of automobile or, or aircraft, whatever you want to call VTOLs. it. Yeah. Did v- you ever play v- video games? VTOLs. You've no. Obviously, never played. Oh, never mind. I mean, it reminds me of like the Har- do you know like the Harrier jump jet, the UK yeah. fighter jet that basically turns its like thrusters downwards and like just takes off vertically. That would have then... been the first VTOL thing. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, by the way, if you're listening to this, I'm just as clueless as uh, as, as you are about what they're talking about. But right. anyway, carry on, please. Anyway, th- so I think like in terms of flashy, attention grabbing tech out of CES, anything that flies and sort of can carry people is going to always sort of steal the show. Um, but it, it, it again, it's a couple of years off. Like we're, we're, we're not even very close to like self-driving cars yet. I mean, you saw last year with the f- couple of fatalities and it, it, it's, we're quite... on roads in California and other places around the world. You can't say we're not there. You can say maybe we're not the level of technology would like or the level yeah. of safety would like, but they're out there. The, no, no, the, the, make no mistake. Like these things, as you say, are on the roads in certain parts of the US and, and elsewhere. But I mean, in terms of them actually being driven into people's like homes and, and you know, for them to become completely completely accessible to the wider public, we're still some way off No, in fact, there was a a good case in California about three weeks ago where the CHP were driving down, uh, California Highway Patrol were driving down the freeway at about three in the morning Mm. and found some guy who'd been out drinking and decided to take his, I believe it was a Tesla, home for the night and put it on autopilot and then proceeded to fall asleep uh, behind the wheel and let the car take him home. And the police were having none of that and actually invented a new way to stop automated cars when the driver is incapacitated. That's the point. If it's self-driving, then you can be intoxicated and get behind the wheel because no, you're not driving that's it. that's illegal. <laughs> yeah, that's very But he's illegal. not driving it. It's self-driving. The, problem, the, rule, the rule is you have to be able to take the wheel in case of a malfunction right, or something else. Right, I see. Okay. They're not to the level where you can go ahead and get in the car and take a snooze on the way home. Yeah, you, you have to really still be in control even if you're not driving it. Um, and and, that, and that, so, I, so I suppose that's what I mean when I say they're still some way off of kind of total widespread adoption because you know that that is the dream right the dream is like i can do my morning commute to work and i can get in the car and get an extra 15 20 minutes of sleep or whatever right because the car is going to drive me to the office but we're not really at that point yet um it's still very much a hybrid system where you do need to be to be in control and and you know the the question always becomes like these demonstrations that take place at CES how much are we actually seeing of the real tech yeah. and how much are we seeing a very tightly pre-programmed uh, presentation well, this has always been the case with, with uh, CES I mean I've mm. covered them for a number of years and very often very little of what you see there is ready to go in mm. the stores by the time you get back from the show mm. maybe not even by the end of the year or the year after that yeah so a lot of the stuff is just hey look 
you know, proof of concept stuff. Yeah. Let me show you what I can do, and maybe we'll have it out in a few years. And I'm sure the VTOLs or the taxis, whatever you want to call them, are still pretty much in that category. Did, I did, mean, listen, the first time I covered CES was 10 years ago. And at that point, actually having screens in cars was the new thing, yeah. not even HUD screens. And I remember they went nuts the first year I was there. They literally had a car where they put a screen everywhere possible, including the wheel wells. Mm-hmm. I mean, if there was a— Including the what? Wheel wells. That's that area where your wheel goes into the car. The steering wheel or the dry, actual wheel? <laughs> no, that piece of rubber outside the car which spins around and yeah. round okay. and attaches <laughs> to the ground. That actually comes out, and they put screens in behind that. For whom? For the hell of it, to show all the possibilities you could pop. I mean, it was overkill for a, for right, a point. Okay. It wasn't actually you know a serious thing, but they had them everywhere. You pop open the trunk, pop open the hood, there would be screens there. You don't no, – like there was a demonstration – go on, sorry. Yeah, I was saying, and since then, obviously, it's moved forward quite a bit. Yeah. You know, we're moving quickly into the area. I want to see what the HUDs will do. Uh, these heads-up displays. Yeah. I'm, basically, when you're – Explain, please, these, these acronyms right, you're driving you're down speaking. the road, and right now you have your, you know, your speedometer and you have all the other gadgets in, on your car. In the future, that will pretty much be gone. What you'll have is your windscreen. The back of it will have numbers and everything else superimposed on it. So you can still drive, but you'll be able to see in digital format. But your isn't speed. that distracting from the road ahead of you? No more than it is now having it right underneath because you got to take your eyes off the, the road to read your right, dials. Okay. Now you have it right there in front of you. And you'll also be able to program things in like maps. So it'll say, turn here, follow this mm. road, or do something else. There's all kinds of possibilities. Yeah. And they're slowly getting to that. It's not quite there yet, but I'm yeah. really looking forward can to I that. Can I ask you, when you hear about these things coming out of CAS, do they – Worry you or do they excite you? Well, most of the time, I'm pretty excited. And most you? of the time, Ed. Do you mean do they worry? Why would they worry me? I suppose because I for me, well, I mean, maybe worry is not the right word, but for I read about some of them and I'm like, I don't need that much invasion. I don't need my fridge to know what I'm eating. I don't need my mirror to know what I'm doing. I don't mm. need to. I don't need that level of like intrusion. I, I feel like you you would have said the same thing though 20 years ago. If we'd been talking about this, if I told uh, you had a GPS-enabled phone that tracks yeah. you wherever you go and can give you a, you know, a, a view of every trip you've taken over the past five years, you'd probably say, "No, that's massively invasive," and it still sort of is, but it's there and it's mm-hmm. actively being done by millions of people every day. So my fridge deciding to place an order for a gallon of milk because I'm, you know, running low, not to me a, a, anything worse than what I'm already doing. Yeah, yeah I, I don't like it. But I think okay. it becomes about. Conve- I, see your point. I, I do understand what you're saying, and I, and I think it's an ongoing conversation. But I think it really boils down to like convenience versus sort of invasive technology. And ultimately, with mobile phones, we trade off the Im- invasion of our privacy yeah. for the convenience of having a mobile phone. And likewise, with things like GPS and and even social media, you know, we we trade off what we know social media is doing yeah. to us. Well, um, I'm much more likely to go down that road. I've already deleted my. Facebook but I mean, and you're still on else. Twitter, Scott. So yeah, but and tw- Instagram. You're not. You're not much yeah, better Instagram's than the rest like of us. Instagram, I think it's just got to go. Instagram and maybe even WhatsApp. I'm and you're on Snap. I mean, come on. You just actually, you only deleted Facebook. No, I'm not on Snap. I'm on, Twitter. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. Golf lot. News is on Snap though, so I'll just plug that quickly. We have a weekly yes. show on Snap. You can find me on Snap on Golf News, but I don't have my own personal Snap account. Yes, you do. I don't use it. Yeah, but uh, you you have it, and yeah. so it can track your location because it has a location enabler. Yes, I know. If I take a Snap, which I never do. And you can switch that off in the settings. It still has your email details. Yeah, so everyone has my email details. I'm a journalist <laughs> in the Middle East. Believe me, is there someone out there who doesn't have my email details? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so really that, that debate between convenience and, and invasion is, is, is ongoing. And, and I think, you know, there's a safety component. And I do see what you're saying about the sort of level of distractions in cars. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the prototypes that we saw a couple of days ago out of CES had screens within the steering wheel you know that you could sort of use and 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 there were a lot of questions raised about okay now people are not just looking at the sort of the tickers just beneath their line of sight out of the windscreen but they're looking at the steering wheel it's like this is probably going to be quite distracting so but if it has like a map instead of looking at your phone then that would be okay yeah but, but there's mm-hmm. even worse than that uh, there were a couple of stories about uh Augment, not sorry, not augmented reality, but virtual reality mm. being made for cars. Now, if you're not familiar, virtual reality is where you actually have a screen or a, some type of glasses on over your eyes. Yeah, and it's not really quite sure what the implication is going to be, whether or not you'll use an external sensors to drive on the data that's being beamed to your eyes, or whether or not that's for your passengers, because there are games and other things which they can been, they've been promoting with this. 
that's going to be a problem. The augmented reality, I'm not so worried about because that's basically your heads up to screen. That's the same thing. Mm. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the cars we saw last year was developed by Panasonic and it effectively was like almost windowless in the back. So it could seat, I think, five or six people in the back of the car. And it really wasn't even a back, if I saw it correctly. It was basically a table, like a yeah, kitchen table. It, it was and like everyone could sit around it on the way out of the road. It really was like, yeah. I mean, sitting around as we are now in the back of a car, and it was sort of effectively windowless with like TV screens where the windows used to be. And as you say, you could change the configuration to a living room style sort of setup where we would all sit and look at each other and we could sort of talk or whatever. And then if you hit a couple of buttons, it would shift the seats around and it would bring out a desk and you could sort of work and sort of have an office in the back of your car. So, I mean, I, I, like going but back to... I mean, to how realistic are these things? Are they going to be launched in like 50 years, 20 years? No, no, much, years, much shorter term than that. I would say like five to s- 10 years. Yeah, I was say you're going to start seeing them become mass produced by about five years. You reckon? Yeah. Mm. They're already being developed and there are already some working prototypes out there. Uh Dubai World Trade Center has some working prototypes of driverless vehicles, and I believe one is similar to the Panasonic, yeah. but I wouldn't swear to it. Yeah. But, so those things are out there. They're coming. I mean, people are actually trying to find ways to integrate them into the current system. So, yeah, it's shorter than you think. Yeah, I think we're on the cusp right now of having sort of very traditional petrol, diesel cars that, that have very minimal amounts of tech in them. I mean, only really sort of newer model cars have sort of inbuilt sat-navs or GPSs and, and sort of have digital systems within them. You look at the Teslas with their enormous sort of central displays um, above where the sort of uh, gear stick or the handbrake would be in a normal car. So the, and, and they really are the only company that, that sort of bring as standard that level of, of technological integration. But I think it's something that you're going to see change quite rapidly in, in the newer model of cars as tech becomes cheaper, it becomes easier to put that in there. Um, and I think within five to 10 years, we'll probably all have quite a high degree of technology in our cars. Um, Ford's making major steps in that direction. They've been working on it for years. Uh, BM, not BMW, Mercedes, I believe, had a number of announcements at CES. Yeah. It's it's a growing trend, and it's not just for niche cars now. It's getting to be mass-produced. Yeah. Okay, cars aside, what else did you like about CES? Well, I'll be honest. I Part of what I saw about CES didn't have anything to do with the tech. It had a lot to do with the cross-platform technologies that are out there. Samsung will now allow you to have Apple iTunes on the device. Mm. Right. Now, that may not sound like a big deal because obviously they've just added an app. But this is two major rivals working yeah. together, which is going to save me some money in the long run. I'll no longer have to worry about if I buy an LG, do I have to buy an Apple TV to go along with it to stream what's on my you know, my movie catalog onto that TV. Now, hey, it's simple. Buy Samsung, bring up my Apple stuff. Five years ago, that was inconceivable because these guys were considered major rivals. Mm. So you're actually, Less than five as well, not just... Uh, I mean, you can go back longer than that, or yeah. You know. But I mean, the point is, though, you're actually seeing major companies who were generally used to be suing each other left, right, and center are now actually working together to make their, you know, various catalogs or products available across you know other sectors. And I think that's pretty good. That's a good sign. Yeah, I think this is a good thing, and I, I, I think you know there are a lot of companies out there vying for sort of dominance in smartphones or in TVs or actually, you know, home the, entertainment. The, the biggest fight this year at CES we hear about is Google Assistant versus Alexa. Yeah. That seems to be everywhere. That was, And that really was the fight of last year as well. And I, and I, I think Google have really, from what I've seen out of CES in the last couple of days, Google have really beefed up their offering for this year. They've got way more integration for Google Assistant, which is their version of Alexa, the voice-activated uh, assistant. Um, way more integration and a lot more contextual sort of uh, intelligence of the service. So she under, or he it understands a lot lot more about what you're asking you know i remember like on the podcast last year we did a few tests of siri alexa and and um, google assistant and cortana the microsoft one and i remember we asked siri um what the population of the u.s was and then we asked her a follow-up question about the population but she didn't link the two questions right. uh she didn't she just didn't get the context of the second follow-up question because it didn't specifically state sort of the us or whatever so i think that that's coming along quite fast and and actually just to link that back to the cars one thing we're seeing more now is like amazon alexa crossing over into the cars so you're listening to a podcast or listening to some music in your kitchen on alexa you leave the house you get in the car 
and Alexa picks up where you left off uh, on that podcast or on that song and starts piping it straight into your car. So I, I think, you know, Alexa, Google Assistant, whatever, you know, whatever wins out of that battle, um, it'll probably be a, a number of them. It won't just be one. Will will sort of eventually permeate every aspect of our lives, you know, and, and like I mean, much like in the films, right? When you yeah. see in the films, like the guy walks around his house, he's in the shower, he's like, all right, you know, order me some some shampoo, and then he gets in the car, and then he's at work, and he's talking the whole way what through. What film was that? Uh, I I think I Robot. <clears throat> oh, okay. With Will Smith, he's like got this this assistant constantly around to do digital sort of digital tasks for him. So. There actually is a real-world application of Alexa at CES, mm. which may actually stretch that analogy way too far. Mm. Collier, which is an American plumbing company, I mean, they don't they deal more with plumbing, but they actually have an Alexa-enabled toilet. Mm, nice. Complete oh, yeah, with, complete I, saw, with, I saw the news on yeah, that. Yeah, seat warmer and blow dryer, and yes, apparently you can dock to your toilet now while you're that's, doing your thing. Interesting right fact, it's $7,000, that yeah. toilet you're talking about. That's, a, it's, yeah. that's, that's nothing to spend. There you know. is a number of high-end stupidity going on at CES. And every year, this is always part of the fun thing. I mean, not only do we have an Alexa-enabled toilet, we also have, what was the the other one? Oh, yes, the was Foldamat or something like this. It the is one based on Foldimate. Foldy Foldy yeah. It is a giant machine. And I mean, it is like, what, five, six it's feet It's bigger tall. than my fridge. Yeah, it's boxy as hell. But you throw your laundry in there, and it will fold it for you. And it c- only costs... $980. I think it's a thousand, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. basically, if you have room to spare and money to throw away, you a can. A lot of room to spare, like a second fridge room to spare. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't get the appeal of this at I all don't, because I, don't. I mean, now if we, if if it was if it was ironing, if it ironed my clothes, no, nope, then holds. then we can talk. Actually, I think then I'm spending then, thousands. I'm like, yeah. If they combine That's this with the Roomba, you know what the Roomba is? Roomba right. is a remote controlled. Uh, vacuum cleaner. It's right. a little disc, uh, probably about the size of a giant frisbee. That will you can program it to roll over your floor and uh, sweep and clean up. Now you mix that with the ability to pick up my clothes and then put it in the washing machine and then fold it. Then we got something. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, but I'm not going to spend you know nine hundred eighty dollars for a yeah. giant closet to fold my stuff for me. There is the um, what's that thing that Sheldon uses on the Big Bang Theory to fold his clothes? It's tiny. Yes. Mm. It's also just plastic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you can buy that if you want to fold your clothes more Never easily. Never been looking for that, but glad to know you've been, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've got no interest in that, but uh, genuinely. And, and there's probably someone yeah, see, out there. It's not tech unless you know, basically you can plug it in. So a little piece of plastic that just folds it for you, yeah, it doesn't but cut I mean, it for that, me. But I mean, that tiny little thing that fits anywhere yeah. defeats the purpose of that whole gigantic yes, $1,000 thing. And probably costs, yeah. Ten dollars yeah, versus something a thousand. Like that. Yeah, no, uh, like in terms of sort of like home gadgets like that, like I'm not particularly interested in anything that doesn't sort of make my life extremely easy. And um, you know, like I'm tempted. I think you could solve all of those problems really just by f- like finding a you know girlfriend who or wife who earns loads of money and then just becoming like a house husband. And you have got loads of time to do all of that sort of stuff. Ed the gold digger. All yeah, right. exactly. We know where your technology. That's my. Was. That's if my. If you're listening, this was Ed asking for. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for solici- uh, yeah. Soliciting for a wealthy wife. No, that that like I think for me like when I saw last year all the Samsung washing machines, Samsung fridges, and all that. Like, and we can segue now into talking about home tech or like you know smart homes because that is another big thing. And actually, when I was in the UK uh, in December. I went into a you know regular sort of consumer electronics store, the kind of place you buy like a PlayStation and a TV, nothing too sort of specialist or niche. And I was taken aback by the amount of home tech, specifically security um, that I saw. And, and I sort of, it made me realize once I sort of dig, you know, had a look into it and sort of did some digging that really the, the cost of things like security cameras that, you no longer need a sort of central uh, system to record things onto tape or whatever. Uh, there's, that doesn't exist anymore, really. I can just get like a, a kind of Google-enabled uh, CCTV camera, put it outside my house, and get live 1080p video streamed direct to my mobile phone 24 hours a day in color. You know, it's like, so I think that kind of stuff is really coming on a long way. Actually, I think this is going to be a little bit of a hiccup when adopting that. My wife for Christmas got me a Nest home thermostat. Mm. The proof that I'm middle-aged, it was the gift I wanted, a new thermostat to keep the bill down. <laughs> nice. 
But then I got to the point where I had to install it. Now, there's places in Dubai you can call to come out and install it, but I'm more of a do-it-yourself guy. So I got out my kit and opened it up. And it wasn't that difficult to install, but there's a different issue here. You have here. a kit? I have a full toolbox at home. with. I don't have a kit. Classic, have, classic Gen Xer. Yes, do it yourself, yes. I don't yeah. even have a, a can opener, and I don't know how to use one. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> yes, we'll go <laughs> down that road later. <laughs> but anyway, I opened this thing up, and I realized that the Nest, as, as cool as it is, as interesting as it is, is not compatible with my home. One, you have to have everything sort of wired correctly, mm -hmm. and in this case, you had to have some fairly modern wiring to plug into your stuff. My apartment's probably 12, 13 years old, maybe even older than that, and it didn't have it. And the second thing was whoever built my home maybe got a little bit on the cheap side and did not put in good copper core wiring. They put in copper thread wiring. This may not sound like a big deal, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, trust me, it's just a matter of someone got cheap a couple of years ago, and now it won't work with my home products. People doing so, things on the cheap in Dubai? Never, yeah. surely so, not. Basically, what was a 1,000 Durham thermostat, which I would love to have, will cost me probably in the area of about, oh, Two to three thousand minimal oh, to have install. Oh, you not installed it yet? I had to take it back. I mean, literally, it's going to cost oh, me four times you the amount. You refunded it? Yeah. Oh, shame. And no, they were good about it. They took it right back without any complaints. But I really, I would have had to rewire the house. You refunded a Christmas present, though. I yes. mean, okay. Okay, my wife was not going to let me sit there and what else know, you let it go to rot. It? You know, it was a thousand right? dirhams. What else are you going to do with it? If it, I mean, if regift. Yeah, I'm not regifting it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's his present. He needs to get another one. No, no. When I, when I get a new apartment or a better place, we'll we'll. Will upgrade then, but I mean, if you're looking to go out and look for smart home stuff, your people are going to have to deal with the fact that maybe their homes aren't up to the code yeah. necessary to get this new stuff in there. I mean, if you want, what is the home security device? The Ring, yeah, which is very cool. Someone comes up, rings your doorbell, and all of a sudden you get a notification on your phone with a live feed. You yeah. can see exactly who it is. Yeah, or you can look in the peephole. What if you're not home? Yeah. What if you have someone delivering a product to your house and you're not there? What if you have, you know, one of your family members comes over and you're, you know, in the bathroom, you know, or something which you can't rush out. You hit a, hit a button, open the door, then come on in. There are practical applications. Or if you're it. old and getting up is a, an effort, yeah. then you can see who's at the door and decide whether it's worth getting up for. Can you communicate with Ring? Can you yes, talk? There it's is, like an intercom is, yeah. sort of system. Yeah. So you can say to them, like, hi, who is this? And they can say, I'm from Jehovah's Witness. And you can tell them to yep. piss off. Yeah. Uh, Basically. But the problem is with this thing, though, is most people here in Dubai who have apartments are not going to pay to have this stuff installed. No. Because it means not only installing something in your door, it means actually having to change your locks, which your landlord may not approve of. So there's yeah. all kinds of implications. So if you're looking at smart home stuff, do your reading first before you get yeah. out there. And even that savvy $7,000 toilet isn't going to be easily installed with your plumbing. Like, yeah, you don't I'm know sure how people I think are really worried about that angle. Yeah. I think if you're spending $7,000 on a toilet, you probably don't care about the yeah. uh, installation You cost. can pay for the, uh, the additionals that come along with it. But I think that's a really important point, actually, about the practical sort of application of some of this technology because, I mean, really, it's not just plug and play for everyone. And, and I think, you know, we live in a region that, whilst it is very technologically advanced in many ways, still lags behind in other areas. So like the classic example really being Alexa, not being sort of fully integrated with the sort of global network. So yeah, if you, she's not launched here she, yet. She's still not launched later. here. So if you buy an Amazon Alexa. I mean, you can go a bit further backwards than that and just talk about Skype, but that's, but, but that's but another I mean, issue. Yeah, but in the sense of like, you know, Skype is, is a sort of application that just doesn't work here. Yeah. Whereas Alexa is something you can buy. It's hardware. You you know, the, the Amazon Assistant, you can buy it, but you can't. She, she'll work, she'll talk to you, but she just won't be able to sort of get all of the data and, and stuff that she that she would in countries where That's she's been launched. That's not entirely so. true. I can ask it to do stuff. I mean, I, I still have three of them in my home spread around. And I can right. say things like, you know, hey, what's the weather today? And it will give me anything but UAE. Because it's not not been launched here. Sure. But if I turn around and say, "What's the weather in Dubai today?" It'll yeah. come right up and tell me everything I want to know. Right, right, right. But she just won't be tailored to right. Dubai. Yeah, the kind which of means context. I also can't order products on yeah. it or a bunch yeah. of other services there. So, so the full suite of services is not sort of enabled here. And and so you know that I would lump that in into the same sort of conversation of uh, you know installing appliances in that you know you have to remember that. What, what might be built. And this is true for the developers as well, the Googles of the world, the Amazons of the world. They need to also be aware that when they develop products in Silicon Valley or, you know, in the Pacific Northwest, 
they have to remember that those products are going to be used in other parts of the world that aren't necessarily compatible with the way they're developing it. So um, that is something to bear in mind if you're a tech fan here in the Middle East that, you, you, you know, you might not find that you can start going to the toilet immediately with your seven thousand dollar toilet what a shame what a what a crying shame um so that's the home tech side and um, what about health i know you're quite into health scott well i liked the number of things i saw out there but i didn't really see anything this year which really pushed any boundaries mm. uh, a lot of it was focused on ecg type mm. of equipment which is very similar to what we saw launched on the apple watch which is nice to see it out there and you know people doing more medical things but I didn't see anything to move it beyond that. Mm. Uh, I've seen a lot of apps out there too that you know will help you get this information and track it. But let's face it, unless you're a doctor, you're probably not going to be able to read an ECG chart. <laughs> yeah. So at the end of the day, I'm not quite sure what how helpful that's going to be. On your on your Apple Watch, when you get your data back um, from your sort of vital signs or whatever it's measuring, does it? deliver it to you in sort of quite an easy to yeah i have an way. app i pop open and i can look and see what my heart rate is right. i can see you know how it was when i was sleeping uh, i don't have it on this one but do but you know what the normal heart rate is or does it yeah. just show you yours no no it, it, i know enough about medical stuff in the oh, background i know like... what a normal heart rate should be but i can you know, look at it in mine all right you know normal heart rate i think for a man in his 40s is about 90 to 110 or something like that mine's anywhere between 60 and 70 so i interrupt right. this for a public service yes yeah. yeah, too much information about scott's uh heart but in general you know you can look and see it you you can look it up too most of it's it's put in a fairly easy way but most of the stuff, I don't think people are going to be looking for their heart rate or their blood pressure. It's more of immediate things like, uh, you know, did I trip and fall? Will my, you know, will my phone or my watch call emergency services mm. for me? Apple has that already on its device, which is great, but I don't see anyone moving it beyond that point. And, and, and Apple is telling you when you're in the healthy range of like how many steps you've taken in a day. I mean, it will tell you in quite an easy to understand way, like if you've hit this bar to the full, then you've done your steps yeah. for the day. And that they all do that. Fitbit does that. Right, right. But yeah. I mean, we're just in the context of like delivering that data in a kind of bite size, easy to yeah. understand way, then then that's quite useful. You yeah. don't just want a, a bloody chart or an Excel spreadsheet of numbers that you have no idea how to no, read. No, no, it, it breaks it down pretty well. Yeah. But, but like I said, everyone's got their own thing. I mean, I like the Apple Watch. My wife likes her Fitbit. I use Fitbit too for a while. I thought it was great. But, you know, uh, I don't see anything out there that's not a re production of what's there i guess i keep saying this mm. I, you know this year has not been as exciting on the medical side as i was hoped it was going to be mm. i think that's it's definitely an area that's going to keep on growing um perhaps this year is is not sort of a the best year for it but it's certainly something that i think is if i was to pick a sector to watch in the coming years i think health is just going to become ever more important i did see some stuff out there though that was fairly interesting in terms of environmental impact mm. um there was one company and i forget the name of it too which i really wish i should had it here because it's mm. a pretty good thing they did they actually developed a water cooler that is basically a de dehumidifier mm. it sucks the moisture out of the air around it and turns it into drinkable water mm. that's cool so you no longer have to worry about plastic bottles or the quality of your drinking water or anything you could else put that in dubai in like the summer and it would just yes, generate you can, yeah. a ton of own, water yeah exactly so i mean the stuff like that is pretty good now, i don't know how much electricity that consumes but i assume that was part of their consideration but mm. people are looking to do things that actually you know have a you know relatively positive impact on people what about, um, I, I saw some pieces before CES started about, and, you know, we'd be remiss to not mention it, the, the border situation or the wall situation currently ongoing at the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, I saw some, some pieces before CES started talking about uh, the situation there and how, you know, CES was going on in sort of in the shadow of this, this situation. Um, has, has there been anything actually... Con Sort of contextually relevant to that, to that crisis. You mean the technology that's yeah. going on down there, uh, the off switch. You can turn off Donald Trump on Twitter, maybe. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I no, I haven't him. seen any technology. I mean, there's things I'm sure which will probably come out of there. Drones being used along a border, I think, is already a pretty, you know, fair phenomenon now among among countries. But I haven't seen anything in particular which makes me think that anyone at CES is developing border security. Because mm. I mean, CES has a sort of a good image, I would say a kind of good image in the sense that, that you get a lot of, as you say, a lot of sort of 
ethical, uh, environmentally friendly technology coming out of it. You have people with kind of good intentions. It'd be quite interesting to see if someone turned up with sort of the new technology for a border wall, what how, what the reaction to that would be. <laughs> I haven't seen anything on that. No. Most of this stuff is me- meant for mass consumption. It's consumer electronics at the end of the day. Mm. So, I mean, unless you can sell it to the average person on the street, most people don't want it. And most people true. don't need their own personal border That's wall. That's true. I did see that CES got in trouble, though, for giving an award to a company making adult toys and uh, that was then rescinded uh, so there's been a bit of controversy there but yeah anyway yeah that was just more of an image thing and not necessarily a uh, well we won't go too much into that yeah and I think on that note maybe we'll uh, wrap it up what about TVs just briefly do you see any TVs because I mean like that TVs I feel is like the most consumery of, of the lot right and like everyone has a TV 8k right I have a TV at this home. is exactly how I feel about all the other tech why do I need this Mm. Well, the thing is, most of the time, Fair. 4K is pretty high definition, and we haven't got everything caught up to 4K yet. There's still plenty out there, which is just high definition. Mm. And so the only reason you really need an 8K TV is so you can get a bigger TV out of it and maintain that sort of 4K image, which I don't need a 108-inch TV in at the moment, and that's sort of where that goes. I think it's just a little bit of ahead of its time. I mean, and it's only for the day when TVs get really cheap, much cheaper than they are now. And even now today, by all standards, they're cheap. So cheap. I can't believe how cheap they are. Yeah. You know, like to get, I mean, in the in the old days, you had the, when you had the box TV and it was like to get anything above sort of like 30 inches or something was, was thousands of dollars. And of course, now, and you would break your back carrying it. Break your back yeah. carrying it and you have to have tons of space in the house to even fit in the living room. But I mean, now you can get like a 40 inch flat screen HD TV for you know 600 dirhams or whatever. I mean, it's so cheap. It yeah. really is, um, which is awesome. I mean, it's awesome that everyone now can have access to really crystal clear widescreen sort of TV. Yeah, but at the end of the day, you need to get. I don't know how much can you keep adding to this. I mean, computers right. hit a point a couple of years ago where you know for a long time they kept adding new RAM, new storage. And after a while, people got to the point where I don't need more RAM. I don't need more storage. So they sort of maxed out at around you know, 16, 32, mm. maybe 64 you know, GB on the RAM side. But after mm. a while, I was like, okay, I don't need any more than that. Mm. Resolution on TVs, you should get to the point it's sort of becoming the end of the line. Mm-hmm. How much more do we actually need? And then what comes after that? All right. Now, here's the one thing which I didn't see at CES, which I hope we'll see more of in the years to come. Where's the 5G stuff? Mm. No BlackBerry 5G this year. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple things coming up. But mainly it's more along the lines of networking. Mm -hmm. So get your house set up to set to receive 5G and do other stuff like this. Networks that may, you know, mesh networks that may cover your house, you know, to work with 5G or something along those lines. Mm. But I want to see more of that come up over the next year. Yeah. Well, I mean, the big story hanging over last year was the uh, deal falling through between, <clears throat> excuse me, between uh, Huawei, the Chinese consumer technology company, and uh, AT&T, I believe. Yeah. Um, and uh, there was a proposed merger and it fell through um, at days before CES began. And Huawei had been planning to announce it at the conference. And in the 12 months since that happened, and of course that deal fell through because of U.S. government concerns about Chinese technology gaining you know, too, too great a foothold in the U.S. In the 12 months since then, obviously that story has become sort of enormous. We saw the arrest of one of Huawei's uh, most senior executives, the CFO uh, in Canada, um, we've seen obviously heightened trade tensions between U.S. and China, and Huawei, con- you know, concerns about Huawei and their 5G networks in the U.K., in Western Europe, in the U.S. and Canada. So, you know, certainly one of the biggest global vo- 5G players. And t- to let you know, for everyone who's listening, 5G is obviously when you open your phone and you see 4G. 5G is the upgraded network to that. Um, We've seen, seen one of the biggest players, Huawei, really sort of being taken off the off the map in a bit. In, in yeah, and it's at a bad time too because 5G right now is really beginning to just enter the market. Mm. If you don't know what 5G is, I just mentioned a few minutes ago. It's a mobile phone technology. When we had 2G, you could barely even get email across it. 3G, you could start getting stuff. 4G was great for video, and 5G is supposed to really open up your phone to a whole bunch of new experiences mm. to stream and get massive amounts of data all at once. So uh, this is not the time to get kicked out of a particular marketplace if you're looking to get into network uh, technology. Yeah, but if you're a government who's got protectionist tendencies, then it's good if you have local players and you don't want to compete. Protectionists? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, right. All right, now can I end the show? Yes, you can end the show now. All on right, that, I think on that bombshell. We're going to end that since Sarah's being in the glaze over, too. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to talk of technology and 5G. All right, um, you can always find this podcast, as you know, on uh, Twitter, at Durham's Dollars. Uh, I think we're also going to have this particular uh, video of the uh, podcast on YouTube. Yeah, it's something we're trying to do every week now, I think. So just yeah. go to YouTube and go to the Golf News page on YouTube. You can find all of these podcasts and all of our other videos on there. And we're also on iTunes. And, of course, you can find me on Twitter at Scott Shuey. I'm on Twitter at Ed Klaus. And I'm on Twitter at the Sarah Dear. All right, everyone. Thank you for watching.